Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Today we have a special broadcast and to start this broadcast we have prepared an article which we will watch together. Flotilla. What is the first thought that comes to mind when hearing this word? A formation of different military vessels from past historic war times? Or a leisurely fleet of like-minded sailing enthusiasts embarking on a holiday trip? From Israel's perspective in recent years, this term is usually associated with different attempts by pro-Palestinian activists to break Israel's naval blockade on Gaza. This aerial naval blockade was formed in 2007, when the internationally recognized terrorist organization Hamas, which has vowed in its charter to wipe Israel off the world map, took control of the Palestinian enclave and began launching rockets towards the southern regions of the Jewish state. This prompted the State of Israel to enact measures to protect its civilian population. From then on, pro-Palestinian activists from different countries worldwide have launched numerous naval campaigns with the aim of breaking the blockade. When we are going to Gaza, we are going with goods, but the most important thing is a message to the people of Gaza. You are not alone. We see you. We will not let it be silent in the world until the situation will be solved, until the blockade will be lifted. This is a solidarity message that is as important as the little goods that we can take. This is a, a humanitarian catastrophe because of political reasons, and it can be solved only by political measures. We have been always uh, calling upon the international community to put pressure on Israel to end the siege, and we always supported the official and popular efforts from the international community to help convincing or pressurizing Israel to end the siege. The most famous of naval campaigns culminated on May 31, 2010, when Israeli commandos boarded six Turkish flotilla ships that had refused Israeli demands to change their destination from Gaza to the Ashdod port, where the ships were to be inspected. You are approaching an area of hostilities, which is under a naval blockade. The Gaza area, coastal region, and Gaza harbor are closed to all maritime traffic. The Israeli government supports delivery of humanitarian supplies to the civilian population in the Gaza Strip and invites you to enter the Ashdod port. On board one such ship, the MV Mavi Marmara, which sailed under the Comoros flag with over 500 activists, mostly Turkish, the Israeli forces were received with violent armed resistance and were forced to open fire, resulting in the death of nine Turkish citizens. Israel considers its blockade on Gaza to be legal and in accordance with international law. Its national policy does not allow any protest or humanitarian aid flotillas to reach Gaza. However, it does offer to direct them to Israeli ports and transfer the aid to Gaza by land after inspection. The naval blockade on Gaza is legal and legitimate under a UN report, a report that was commissioned and adopted by the UN Secretary General. The importance of this, uh, of this blockade, the necessity of this blockade has been emphasized over the last few days by the intensification of rocket shooting from Gaza on Israeli civilians. These rockets have sown death and destruction on Israelis while many of the past flotillas originated from Sweden and had been organized by Swedish pro-Palestinian activists, some of the country's Christians feel it's time to change this lopsided chain of events. They want to present the world with a different narrative on Sweden, according to which there are people in the world and Swedes in Sweden that support the Jewish people and the state of Israel. For this reason, a number of Swedish Christians from different walks of life and different Christian denominations, headed by God-believing yacht captain Stefan Abramsson, decided to organize a different kind of protest voyage. Thus, October 11th this year saw the first ever pro-Israeli mega-yacht called Elida arrive from Gothenburg, Sweden, to the Israeli port of Herzliya. Operating under the slogan, Sailing for Jesus, the Swedes on board sailed in show of solidarity with the Jewish state and the persecuted Christians across the Middle East. The people on board is different people from uh, the Swedish community. Uh, there is businessmen, there is four priests from the Lutheran church who say, hello, we want to support Israel. And there is uh, 
politicians, many of them. In, uh, there is uh, ordinary Swedish people who say, hello, we have to do something. We have to say, hello Israel, we want to support you. Another example of those supportive voices for Israel on board Elida was Lutheran pastor Andres Peter Shadin. I've had a love for Israel since I was a teenager. Uh, I came here first time in 75. Uh, worked on a kibbutz Hukuk and kibbutz Gazit. Uh, been coming back once in a while by myself or my wife or with groups. And uh, just to come and uh, bless Israel and tell you that we love you. Israel is always criticized for everything. And once in a while to hear something different. I think it's good for everyone. Among those welcoming Elida in the Herzliya Harbor was Isaac Bachmann, former Israeli ambassador to Sweden, who spoke on behalf of the Jewish state, which has become used to criticism from all levels of Swedish society. He expressed appreciation for the solidarity voyage of the Swedish Christians on board the Elida. For Israelis, uh, we got accustomed to uh, a lot of uh, criticism and a lot of uh, you know, analysis of what Israel does or doesn't uh, from Swedes, be it individuals, uh, parties, political uh, establishment and so on and so forth. So for us to have somebody that uh, takes the initiative and comes with a group of um, 50 Swedes on a um, marine voyage of solidarity with Israel, it's, it's a big thing. It, we, we, we look at it as, as uh, something that should be very much appreciated and this is what we do. We show our appreciation for such an initiative. During the course of the voyage, at different pit stops in the European ports, the captain had to explain to puzzled authorities why Elida was heading towards Israel. Many policemen and, and you know, uh, organizations around in different ports have asked me, you should go to Israel, what's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and then I answered them, where is the only place uh, in Middle East I can go with the boat signed sailing for Jesus? Uh, and then they stop up and start to think, hello, you're right, you have to go to Israel. And, and then I, I said to them, hello, think uh, one turn more. Why can I go to Israel? Because uh, Israel respects the human rights and, and all things what we say is good. So uh, why shouldn't we support Israel? And, and always, that when they start to think about it, oh yes, you are right, we have to do that. So many policemen are, oh, you do a good thing. <laughs> yes, we do a good thing. <laughs>Welcome back. With me in the studio to discuss the topic uh, is Captain Stefan Abrahamson, uh, who is also the organizer of the Flotilla to Israel. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like also to welcome Reverend Magnus Haglund, who is a Lutheran minister in the Church of Sweden. Welcome. And I'd like also to welcome Ms. Karin Nitont, who is uh, the PR representative of Elida and a coordinator of Pilgrim 2018. Welcome. So and our TV7 reporter, Ms. Monika Yaguri, uh, who also welcomed uh, the Elida uh, when they approached uh, the Herzliya port. But I'd like to start with a question to you, Captain Abrahamson. When we're talking about uh, your voyage from Sweden to Israel, what led you to this decision to put your life on hold, take the, your yacht together with a crew of 52 Christians from Sweden and make this long voyage to Israel uh, in what you already declared as a support to the Jewish state and also in support of Christians persecuted across the Middle East? Yeah, it's a long story, very long story. So it depends on how long story you like to have. But, uh, uh, you know, I growing up with a father who was very involved to helping uh, Armenian Christian uh, in the time when there, it was very tough for them. Mm -hmm. I growing up with a father who gave me uh, the values uh, of loving Israel because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Israel is the foundation for all Christian faith. So uh, I, I got uh, it uh, from the very beginning. Then uh, some year later, I got a priest next to me working together, and he started to tell me, you have to go to Israel. And in my, one way, I always loved to go to Israel, but uh, you know, uh, things moving on and you don't do anything. But last year when I was on the, the Jerusalem prayer breakfast, 
uh, I was going around uh, in between the sessions and took coffee on a different coffee house. And I'm a person who likes to speak to ordinary people wherever they are. So uh, in, when I come in there, I have a sign on my, uh, fr from the Knesset. Uh, and when the waiters uh, look at me, my, my uh, sign, he so you're a Christian from Sweden who loves Israel. Is that possible? <laughs> and uh, the whole uh, coffee house was, you know, become absolutely quiet. And uh, they wait for my answer. Mm. So I say we are a lot of people in Sweden who loves Israel. And uh, we are here to pray Jewish and Christian people together for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, I think that I represent a lot of people in Sweden. But in my mind, I start to think we have to do something. So when I come home from that, that, uh, uh, that uh, time in, in Jerusalem, it starts to work. We have to sail to Israel. We have to show ordinary, normal people here that there is a lot of Swedish people who love Israel. Mm. And uh, we have to change the attitude towards Israel in, in our country. So since that time, it has been a procedure until today. Well, I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Hanglund, when we're talking about um, the the Church of Finland uh, of Sweden, sorry, um, we're talking about uh, 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 quite a big church or a big organization mm -hmm. representing Sweden. But at the same time, when you arrived in Israel together with the Elida Yacht, also the board of directors of the Church of Sweden was in uh, Israel but with a different agenda in mind. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how does actually the Church of Sweden um, think about Israel and, and approach this topic? I'd say that the Church of Sweden, the board of the, the Church of Sweden, uh, I can't speak for every one of them, but uh, my guess is that they, they view Israel more of a secular political uh, point of view and not as a fulfillment of the biblical promises made by God to the Jewish people. Whereas I see the, the return of the Jewish people, the establishment of Israel as a fulfillment of the prophetic words in the, in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And since Sweden uh, in the political arena is very pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel, that, that political view is what is governing or running in the, in the Church of Sweden too. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I'm, I'm in opposition. <laughs> I see. Well, uh, Ms. Uh, Nitomet, uh, being the PR uh, coordinator representative for the Alida, uh, to what degree uh, did you receive positive responses uh, back home in Sweden, as well as here in Israel, or was there somewhat of an opposition to your voyage? Well, it's not opposition, I would say, but it certainly is a big difference between the reception in Israel and at home in Sweden. Uh, already before we even left Sweden, we had Israeli media outlets contacting us and they wanted both to do live interviews and TVs, but also articles. So the main media outlets in Israel all made great stories about us about to leave Sweden. And uh, we tried to engage the Swedish press as well, but no one took the bite. Mm -hmm. But uh, And then we knew very little as we set out on the voyage, what would happen when we came here? We just thought, well, we might do something and go visit some places, but we had no idea what we were coming into and we were completely overwhelmed. First of all, by the fl flotilla that, that met us out at sea, but then the interest from the media news coverage here in Israel, it's been totally overwhelming and it's been amazing. However, at the same time, even though we've been trying to send press releases and telling the Swedish news outlet what's happening here, it's completely silent. To so. follow up on that, uh, as we saw in the article, the pro-Palestinian flotillas um, had a press conference, a lot of press came, was very keen on knowing more about it. Yeah. Why is the representation of that side of the spectrum or of the narrative, if you will, so much more interesting to the Swedes than uh, actually coming here with a positive attitude towards Israel and also in support of Christian persecution uh, or Christians that are persecuted in the Middle East, which unfortunately is an ongoing phenomenon. As far as the last part, that is why we do this sale, because it is, it's a complete quietness 
ruling in the West, what's happening to the Christians in the Middle East. So that's one part of the reason for, for the sale. Um, as for the other part, I think it because it goes along the same lines as the political atmosphere in Sweden, what is in the news. And these are the things that Swedes are known to read about and to hear about. And it just keeps, it just confirms the attitudes that they, people have and the, the knowledge that they have, or knowledge so-called. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't fit in there. We don't fit the picture because we come from a different perspective. And instead of being open and showing different sides, it's easier for the media to just continue on the same current that they always followed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to return to your Reverend Hungland. When we're talking about uh, the Christian persecution in particular, um, obviously we would like to know more about the statistics and the facts on the ground. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we're looking at uh, uh, Bethlehem, for instance, a city uh, well known for uh, being the birthplace of our Lord uh, and Savior Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, as well as uh, uh, currently Uh, under the rule of the Palestinian Authority. But uh, some very specific statistics, which is quite interesting, is that when uh, Israel gave over the administrative authority uh, from uh, its own control to the Palestinians, Christian population in Bethlehem was about a little bit more than 80 percent. Today, in 2018, we have less than uh, 21 percent currently being Christian or defined as Christian in Bethlehem. Obviously a significant deterioration just in one city out of many others. How does that, how is that perceived in Sweden as well as in the Church of Sweden, which uh, indicates and is very vocal about its support for the Palestinians over the Israelis? Unfortunately, it's not uh, a question that is brought up that often. The the situation of the Christians in uh, in the Palestinian Authority, We don't often talk about it, and uh, instead people are focusing on the wrongdoings of Israel that they want to to be brought up. So I don't think that uh, people in Sweden realize the the catastrophic situation for Christians in the Middle East and definitely not in the Palestinian uh, Mm -hmm. areas. Well, uh, Captain Abelanson, Obviously, you came here in support of Israel and also the Christians. Uh, Israel is actually the only country in the Middle East where the Christian community is growing yep. as opposed to other countries. To what degree does that signal to you and to others uh, the significance of uh, uh, religious liberties here in the country? Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's very similar to Sweden. You, you can have which uh, faith you want in, in Israel as you can in Sweden. So it's it's an open community, and, and that's one thing we really love with Israel. Mm. Uh, I have a friend in, in uh, Gaza Stripe. I met him uh, first time uh, one year ago on the prayer breakfast. And uh, we have a talk, he's uh, working for the Catholic Church, and he's uh, born in, in uh, Gaza. Uh, so, and he told me that when he, uh, for five years ago, there was 3,000 members of the Catholic Church in, in Gaza Stripe. And now, in June, there were less than 100. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's interesting to hear a person uh, explain the things, because if that is nothing we can read in, in the West media, Western media. Mm. In, uh, uh, and he also tried to, to have a kind of statistic of, of uh, Gaza Stripe. And he says, uh, uh, it's less than 1,000 Christians there today. Mm. Uh, and if you see before, uh, uh, they started the self-steering in, in the, this area. It was uh, something about 40 to 50,000 Christians uh, mm. total in the Gaza Stripe area. Obviously, this uh, uh, continues to fluctuate, and uh, unfortunately, it deteriorates uh, the longer the time passes. Miss uh, uh, Yaguri, you went there to welcome the the uh, Elida when they arrived. What was your experience to see? Also, the Israelis joining that fleet coming in to the port of Herzliya, as well as the people uh, welcoming this. To what degree were they surprised to a certain degree, or was it more of a joyous moment that they were expecting? Well, uh, some of the ladies that we happened to interview over there, uh, they just said that they dropped everything. They left their work and they decided they just will come and go sail with us. 
and to meet them. And in the beginning, when we started out, like maybe it was an hour before your arrival, so there was, wasn't too many around. And then we met you on the sea and came back, and then over the course of the, this um, arrival to the Herzegovina um, uh, Harbor, then uh, I think I counted at least 60, and I've heard that somebody counted maybe 70. Tiny little yachts and bigger ones and speedboats and uh, all even kinds of surfers. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Everybody was there, and then they said yes that, that they they just had to drop everything because mm -hmm. this doesn't happen every day that somebody comes to Israel and says that they love that they love them. Uh, most mm -hmm. people in the world they they hate them or they are indifferent or whatever. So so lots of people express their support and um, most of them on the sea. Miss Nitont, what was the most impressive uh, response you received the moment you arrived? The complete joy from the people. People were crying. People were shouting from both the ships and from the quayside. We love you. Thank you for coming. And I think we somewhat expected that people would be happy, but not to this to this amazing extent. It was. I had a hard. I had to pinch myself, and it was hard to really take it in, mm. and how much it meant. And over the days, over this week. It's been hundreds and hundreds of Israelis coming on board because we've had open ship every day for the public. And they're becoming and, and just seeing and meeting us. And people have literally been crying and thanking us for coming and showing some other view of Sweden, but also people who actually dare to stand up and say, we, we stand together with you, we walk with you. And we love this country and we love what you're standing for. And we're not here to criticize, but to show solidarity and support with you. And it's someone, I think, in the crew said it's like they've been starved from appreciation from Sweden, but from Northern, Northern Europe or other countries. And, and it's like just feeding love into a, a, a starved person. And again, I say it is overwhelming. Uh, Captain Abramson, to what degree do you see this as a successful voyage? And would you uh, uh, try to do this uh, again in the future? Or what, what do you have in store? Yeah, you know, I, I see it as, as a start or a beginning of something because of, uh, you know, we see ourselves as a very small organization. Uh, we are a small organization with a good network. And I think that what we have to do is networking with all Christian communities and Jewish community as well uh, to start a new era of, uh, of friendship towards Israel. Mm. And uh, um, this summer, uh, just before we uh, depart for going to Israel, we have a group of 42 young people on board. They're coming from a non-Christian environment, uh, sailing with us for one week. And then one day I said to them, we should have uh, two Israelis on board mm. to, to join us on this trip. And you can see the skepsis, mm. you know, mm. like this. Uh, but they were on board to a, a young couple on their honeymoon, honeymoon on board on, on, on Elida together with 42 <laughs> others. That's a nice way of have, have honeymoon. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, when, uh, you know, they told about Israel and how to live here and, and so on, and they become friends. And see, after four or five days, when they should uh, go home again, uh, all the 42 youngsters mm. stand in line to give them a hug and tell them that they love them. Mm. So it's a kind of attitude changing. And uh, we, we have an idea now for, for following year to, to always have some Israelis on board because of, uh, in that way we can change the way of thinking. Mm. And uh, uh, I believe also that we are coming back, uh, not only us, but we, we try to even get more boats Reverend Hugland, to what degree uh, the moment you return to Sweden will be this actually perceived as a, uh, a voyage of protest also for the Christian communities that are persecuted in the Middle East? Will this uh, come up to the, the headlines in Sweden or will this remain a, a taboo topic that people rather not talk about? I think that uh, it will be in the Christian newspapers that they, uh, this, uh, our trip here will be reported. Thus far, it's been the Christian papers reporting it and not the other ones. Mm -hmm. It probably will remain like that, unfortunately. But uh, for us, this is important because we make a stand, we make a statement, uh, both as uh, supporters of the state of Israel, of the Jewish people, 
And, uh, and this is a way of showing that we are aware of the situation for the Christian minorities mm. in the Middle East. So hopefully on a, on a personal level, meeting people, this will be a way to bring it up. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I have also another thing. We, we try also to support young uh, uh, people to become politicians. Mm. Uh, because mm. uh, I used to say to oh, every young people, that don't become an idiot, because idiot come from Greece, the Greek language, and it means a person who don't care about the politics. Mm. And I think that Christian young people uh, need to start to become active, because of, we can't change on the inside the church. We need to step out in, in the society and, and stand for something. And this is something we, we really have to teach people to stand Making a stand for our yeah. belief and faith, that's indeed a very important uh, uh, factor of uh, who we are and what we do here. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, Ms. Uh, Nitom, when we're talking about uh, the future voyages, obviously now you had 52 uh, sailors on board, uh, if I may call them like that. Yeah. Um, to what degree is this a reoccurring uh, statement? Well, of course, this was the first time, an exciting time. Will this return and repeat itself in the future? I believe we will do more sales to Israel, yes. We don't know if we're going to make it next year, but we will definitely have more sales to come up in the future because this is an important statement. We see that. And it might be of different uh, nature. Maybe another time we can make more stops in different ports along the way and have meetings with, with both media but people in different ports and talk about these issues. Why is it important? With both of these two issues of standing up for the Christian minorities in the Middle East, but also to support Israel, which is the only democracy in the Middle East, protecting the Christian uh, ideas and their rights. Um, if we can meet different peoples in different ports, that might be another kind of upsell that we could be able to do. Monsieur Aguri, do you think that uh, this will be also uh, an opportunity to unite different countries and, and see also uh, countries like Finland or Estonia join the voyage uh, with yachts from there, for instance? Absolutely. Yes. It is uh, quite a, <laughs> yeah. the intriguing interest uh, of seeing this materialize in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Captain Abramson, yeah. uh, Reverend Hagland. Miss Nitont and uh, Miss Yaguri for being here today and sharing your story of this voyage with us. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.